Welcome to the African Campfire Stories podcast, a podcast dedicated to African history. Our website is www.africancampfirestories.com. We are also available on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. You can leave comments on our website or on our social media pages. Search for African Campfire Stories. We would like to thank all authors who write about history. We rely on the works of these professionals to create this podcast. African History Quickies Episode 7 Ethiopia Defeats Italy Part 2 Towards the end of the previous episode, we stated that you shouldn't look at Ethiopia as an innocent and harmless colonial victim in this story. This understanding is going to be very important later on in the story, as you will witness Ethiopia making deals with European countries, deals that show Ethiopia to be a colonizer and an empire builder. At the same time, European countries of that era had nothing but disdain for all non-white peoples, not to mention non-whites who were Africans. So, please let's keep this in mind for later on. Last time, we looked at the strategic location of the Suez Canal and the fact that controlling that geographic area around the canal and the Red Sea became important. The two main European powers who were competing here were the usual suspects, England and France. The African countries that would be important for exercising control over the canal and the Red Sea were Ethiopia, Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea, Djibouti and Somaliland. So, how in the hell did Italy get involved in this region? Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) See, let's rewind the time for a bit. Somebody else was having his own dreams of conducting colonization in the region. Lured as he was by the potential riches of the Nile River area, the Red Sea area, and the Horn of Africa countries. Enter Ismail Pasha, aka Ismail the Magnificent, a member of the Alawiya dynasty, so named because it was founded by Muhammad Ali Pasha in 1805. Muhammad Ali, an Albanian, had been a commander of the army that had been sent by the Ottoman Empire to kick Napoleon's French armies out of Egypt. After the French left, Ali made himself into a governor of Egypt. He and his dynasty after him were supposed to be overseeing Egypt on behalf of the Ottoman Empire. From 1863 till 1879, when the British would help remove him from power, it was Ismail Pasha's turn to rule Egypt and Sudan. Sudan had been conquered by the Alawiya dynasty in 1820. Episode 1 of our African History Quickies covers the relationship between Egypt and ancient Sudan, aka Nubia, and also Sudan's evolution until it obtained independence in the 20th century. Since the Ottoman Empire doesn't exist anymore, just think of it as the modern-day Turkey, though the Ottoman Empire was much larger than modern-day Turkey. The Magnificent, a.k.a. Ismail Pasha, could afford to think of himself as being an independent ruler because by this time in history, the Ottoman Empire was way past its prime. So if there was really anyone that the Magnificent had to worry about, it was only Britain and France not his supposed bosses in Istanbul. But he should have worried about Ethiopia as well. To realize his dreams of colonial glory, the Magnificent conquered Eritrea and planned to follow that up with the conquest of neighboring Ethiopia. Take note of Eritrea. It was the Magnificent's shenanigans in Eritrea that would unintentionally pave the way for Italy's entry into the region. And thus, Italy's entry into this story. In 1876, the military forces of the Magnificent were defeated by Ethiopia, at that time ruled by Emperor Johannes IV. Since historians say that this defeat was very humiliating, maybe the Magnificence of the Magnificent wasn't that magnificent anymore. And, as if things were not going bad enough for the Magnificent and his successors, the defeat by Johannes IV was soon followed by the Ansar Revolt in Sudan which was led by the infamous Mahdi, a.k.a. Muhammad Ahmad. 
The Mahdi and his revolution make for a very interesting story. It's a story we have every intention of covering in the future. All of these setbacks occasioned Egypt's pulling out of Eritrea and Sudan by 1882. Up until 1882, Egypt had been under the pull of France. I know, I know, I know. I've said that the Magnificent was under the supposed official control of the Ottomans. And now I'm saying that he was under the pull of France. The situation in Egypt, because of the weakness of the Ottoman Turks, by this particular era in history, was nebulous and confusing. So, it's not that I am confused, nor am I trying to confuse you. The situation itself was confused. Britain and France interfered in Egypt in the name of protecting their interests, though Egypt was supposedly under the control of the Ottomans, and though it was also supposed to be governed by the Alawiya dynasty. In any case, in 1882, Britain occupied Egypt. <laughs> Confusing, right? But you will be glad to know that as far as Britain was concerned, all that confusion in Egypt was now over. Britain was in tight control now. After this, France's policy was to undermine the British in the region. The maneuverings and counter-maneuverings of France and Britain against each other would open the way for Italy's entrance into the region. The British preferred the Italians to come on board. Why? Because Italy was a much, much weaker country compared to France. Thus Italy would not present Britain with as much risk to Britain's control over the Nile, Suez Canal and Red Sea areas. At long last, Italy now has arrived in the region, which means Italy is now ready to enter our story. From the time Italy entered this already confused situation, all the way until she was defeated by Ethiopia, her role in this whole story will smack of desperation. But why was Italy desperate? Italy had only become a country in 1861. Before that, as Count Metternich, the leading statesman in Europe, had derisively said, Italy was not a country. It was only just a geographic expression. Basically, up until 1861, Italy was just a bunch of principalities who happened to be located in the geographic space called the Italian Peninsula. So in the 1880s, Italy was still a very, very young country indeed. The newly minted Italians had hoped that unification into one large country would bring about glory and prosperity. But neither was forthcoming. Italians found themselves still living in extreme poverty. To make up for this travesty of a situation, the media in Italy and the Italian ruling classes were imbued with dreams of grandeur. All the major powers in Europe already had acquired colonies for themselves. If Italy was to be taken seriously, maybe getting colonies wasn't such a bad idea. <laughs> this was the thinking in Italy. In 1884, Britain, Ethiopia and Egypt signed a treaty. You just got to love the hypocrisy of the colonial era. Remember I stated that Egypt was already under British control by this time? So how in the hell can Egypt still be making treaties with other territories and other countries as if she was independent? Especially treaties where Britain was the other party in the treaty. That's like making a treaty with yourself. Let us proceed. As part of this treaty, Ethiopia was given ownership of Eritrea. Or at least Ethiopia thought it was given Eritrea. Remember, the armies of Egypt had had to retreat with speed out of Eritrea. So Eritrea, as any self-respecting colonist would think, needed a new master. Britain had entered into this treaty mainly because she didn't want the French to control Eritrea. But Britain is not known as Perfidius Albion for no reason. Here's a little pertinent trivia for those who might be asking, what in the hell is Perfidius Albion? Perfidius meaning untrustworthy, Albion is an ancient name for Great Britain. Although Britain had encouraged Ethiopian Emperor Johannes IV to move into Eritrea, Britain turned around and gave Eritrea to the Italians. What the heck? See, as far as Britain was concerned, they didn't want France in Eritrea. During the time when no one else was available to move to Eritrea, the British told Ethiopia to occupy Eritrea. 
But when Italy proved to be ready and willing to move into Eritrea, Britain decided to jettison her agreement with Ethiopia in favor of a new one with Italy. Now, this is the time you were supposed to recall the words I said at the beginning of this episode. Ethiopia was in essence a colonial power, colonizing and conquering other African countries. You see, because of this, European countries had to sometimes make colonial type arrangements and agreements with Ethiopia. But in the eyes of European powers, Ethiopia would always be a black country. And at this time and place in history, black was inferior. Possibly the most inferior of all the inferior non-white races. So, if Italy later on became willing to take over Eritrea, according to the racial thinking of the time, then Italy was more preferable than some uppity black empire. And Italy could be a European country that could be counted upon to not fall for the charms of France. Because, remember, Britain didn't want France in the region. Italy hated all major European colonial powers, out of jealousy, of course. But since it is a rule that neighbors must hate each other more, <laughs> Italy hated France even more than it did the other European powers. See, outside of just standard neighborly hate, Italy felt undermined by France. France had made Tunisia into a French colony in 1881. Colony? What colony? At the time, Tunisia was euphemistically and legalistically called a French protectorate and not a colony. You just gotta love the European hypocrisy of the colonial era. See, Italy thought that Tunisia should belong to Italy. Why would Italy think that, you may ask? Why not? The Italians of the time would have asked you in return. See, from 1861 until maybe around the time just before Mussolini fell from power in 1943, some Italians thought the Mediterranean Sea and its surroundings were kind of, and this is not a joke, theirs. Why? Because of the Roman Empire. This is so silly that if you want to understand it better, you would need to do your own research on Italy's obsession with restoring the Roman Empire. An empire that by that time hadn't existed for more than 1,000 years. For Italy, the idea was to get anything in terms of colonies, especially colonies where there would be no other European powers to stop you. An uncolonized country like Ethiopia met this criteria pretty well. Nobody was going to give Italy the countries situated in the Mediterranean area simply because a thousand years ago the Roman Empire controlled those places. Places, by the way, which Rome itself had conquered from others. By that logic, America should be given back to the Spanish or the English. And while at it, why not give all of Africa back to Britain, France, Belgium and Portugal? That kind of thing is not practical. However, here's a practical idea. Now that in our story Italy is nicely positioned in Eritrea and Ethiopia is only just next door, I think it's time that they start fighting already. <laughs> they will begin fighting next time, as this is all we have time for today. Stay tuned for the next episode.